Have you ever had an amazing day followed by a confusing day? We break into the story here in John chapter 6. This is a confusing day following an amazing day from the perspective, not of Jesus, but from the perspective of everybody else. The amazing day included listening to him teach his amazing truths, his amazing preaching. We can only imagine what a communicator the Word made flesh was. I don't think he had a squeaky voice. I think he was amazing. He captivate you for hours. Not only did they get to hear him preach those profound truths, which we're going to look at some of them today on the next day that was so confusing to them, but also he healed their sick. And uh, all who came to him were healed, and the power of the Lord was present to heal. And it was a great day, and at the end of the day, he fed everybody to the full, and there was lots of food left over. Miraculously, with a small amount of food, he fed 5,000 men plus women and children. So excited were people at the end of that amazing day. They wanted to make Jesus their king. They decided he was the fulfillment of a prophecy that Moses gave in Deuteronomy 18, that God would raise up a prophet or give Israel a prophet that would be like Moses. And he would speak words to which they would be accountable. And so they were ready to make him king. And so to prevent that from happening, that was not the plan of God. Jesus just kind of disappeared. He went to a mountain by himself to pray. And I'm sure in praying, he prayed for the people, but also about what God wanted him to do the next day. He was a man living as a man anointed by the Holy Spirit, although he was also God. And he communicated with his father, praying for direction for the next day, but maybe also praying for, you know, Lord, I don't want to take shortcuts to your will. I know ultimately I'm going to be king, but this is not your way. And then he joined his disciples that night by walking across the water. They were sailing across the sea, and the winds were rough, the waves were high, and he walks across and joins them. And we preached about that last Sunday Jesus is the great I am. When they saw him, they were afraid, and he told them, I am. Do not be afraid. And today, we're going to look at him making another I am statement. The next morning, the people wake up. Jesus is gone. They want another amazing day. Here we are in verse 22 of John chapter 6. On the following day, the day following this amazing day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. Now, that's a parenthetical statement. When the disciples left, there were no other boats there, and then other boats arrived, and of course they rowed those across to join the disciples and Jesus on the other seashore, the other side of the lake. So let's skip verse 23, parenthetical statement that says other boats came eventually. And just to get, the sentence is so long you can miss the point. All right, his disciples had gone away alone, the end of verse 22. When the people therefore saw, verse 24, that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum, or Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? (laughs) Little did they know he had had a good time the night before. You think surfing's fun, try walking on the waves. Verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now, let's put ourselves in their shoes. They ate to the full the day before. You ever backed up from the table and says, if I ever eat again, I don't know why I'm so full. Well, the next morning they were full. Natural food only fills us for so long, and then we want some more. And these people were miles from home. Who knows where some of them came from? The crowd probably thinned out, but there's still thousands of people that had found Jesus, and they were hungry. And so they went looking for their meal ticket. You know, if he's going to be like Moses, 
He gave us manna every day. Maybe this is going to be a daily occurrence. Be careful that you don't build a religion around one thing that God did. Jesus did things differently. One time he spat on somebody's tongue and he never did it again. There's probably some moron somewhere that tried it. You know? I heard about somebody who uh, ministered to someone with a hernia and hit him in the stomach and they were healed. Some moron heard about that. He started hitting everybody with stomach ailments in the stomach. Injuring folks. One person's meeting may have people falling out as they're being prayed for. Other morons pick it up. They want to do that. They start pushing people down. I heard about a church, I think, out east that had to deal with a lawsuit because the guest speaker was pushing people down and pushed pushed someone down on a lady's upturned high heels. (laughs) Yeah, so um, we want it to be God, right? And so the Lord had healed them. So there wasn't any of them that could claim they had hypoglycemia. And he was ready to give them some spiritual food, but they wanted physical food. They weren't going to die. You can last for days without food. And they're there by a lake, so there's plenty of water. All right, so back to our story. Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Verse 27. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal upon him. Now, this name Son of Man is a profound statement, a fulfillment of a prophecy in Daniel where the Son of Man would receive dominion and power from the Ancient of Days, and the Son of Man was Jesus, and he would rule and have dominion in the earth. So here they are speaking to the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. This is the Son of Man speaking to them, and they just want to fill their bellies, missing out on the opportunity that is theirs. Verse 28, Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Why did they ask that? I guess, you know, if you're not going to multiply food for us, maybe we can figure out how to do it if you'll help us. I don't know. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. You want work? Believe in me. This is where it all begins. Listen to me. Receive me. I'm the son of man. I've got some things to say. This is the work you need to do today. They still don't get it. Therefore, they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? Or you want us to believe believe you? Give us a sign. Now, what are they talking about? They had seen plenty of signs the day before to the point they wanted to make him king. But I guess the amazement had wore off. What work will you do? Verse 31. They give Jesus a hint of what they want him to do. Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're pushing for breakfast, aren't they? (laughs) Then Jesus said to them, verse 32, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. In other words, the manna came from God, not from Moses. Moses was God's instrument, but that manna came from God. And I am the true manna come from God. I'm here. The meal is here. It's me. Talking to you about eternal things. Verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus. He came to bring eternal life. Now physical life requires that we eat food from time to time to sustain us. 
but it has to be from time to time. Otherwise, the bodies die. But eternal food must be received one time, and you have eternal life for life. And Christ is attempting to minister to them eternal truths. Verse 34, they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Okay, we don't understand, but this is the kind of bread we want all the time. They're still thinking of temporary. If I had this bread always, then I won't be hungry. Remember the woman at the well? Jesus spoke to her about water, that if you receive it, it would she'd never thirst again. It would lead to eternal blessings. Give me this water, then I won't have to come here and draw water anymore. <laughs> Speaking of spiritual things, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Speaking to you today on the topic, Jesus is the bread of life. Verse 35 again, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. In terms of your eternal life, receiving the bread and drink from Jesus is eternal. You don't have to get saved again and again and again. There may be times you need to repent, get your heart right. But once you're his child, you're his child. Verse 36. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. The key to receiving from him all begins with believing in him. They saw him. They were amazed by him. They tasted results of his miracles. Some of them are standing there healed and whole because of what he did for them. They wanted to make him king the day before. And now they're wrestling with believing. There was shallow ground. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Now, this is a hard saying because it's insulting to us. None of us are intelligent enough to believe the gospel. None of us are good enough to receive salvation. God in his mercy must open our eyes. These people couldn't believe in him without God's help. They depended on their works, fulfilling the law of Moses, making the Pharisees happy. And here God is manifested in the flesh and they're not believing Him. All that the Father gives me, verse 37, will come to me and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. So when God opens our eyes to receive salvation, we're not in danger of him throwing us out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He's the manna. He is what the manna pointed to. And he didn't come to do his will. He came to do the will of the Father, the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, verse 39, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. If God has opened your eyes to understand the gospel and given you the gift of faith, by grace are we saved through faith, and that faith is not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. He's done that to keep you. You're in his hand, not like this, but you're in his hand like this. If he's got the whole world in his hands, he's got your soul in his hands. Rest in that. It will inspire you to live a life pleasing to the Lord. If you're living under condemnation, it may be because you're dependent on your works to sustain you. You need the bread of life. This bread will sustain you. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing and should raise it up at the last day. There's coming a day of judgment. 
And those who are his will be raised up. Verse 40. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up or her up at the last day. Verse 41. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Well, I guess that means we're not getting breakfast. Verse 42, they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? How fickle people can be. They want to make him king the day before. Now they're questioning who he is. You know, Jesus had an amazing day the day before. And if it wasn't omniscient, the day after could have been confusing to him. But he knew the truth. Unless their eyes were open, they couldn't know who he was. Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. You know what murmuring is? It's a word. I forgot the the grammatical term for it, but it's a word that sounds like what it sounds like. When people murmur, you just hear, People are like that. You know, when someone comes to you and says, people are saying, it generally means probably one other person. People are unhappy or people are complaining. They're exaggerating. That's that's murmuring. Murmur, 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 murmur. All right. Verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. He just emphasized this three times. You can't. Believe in me unless God enables you. And those who are enabled to come to me and receive me, I'm going to raise them up. Eternal life. Verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. The fulfillment of that prophecy is all those who believe in Jesus will believe in him because God taught them to. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. You know, it's human nature to become wise in your own opinion and think your theology is correct and you've got it going on and become hardened and hard-hearted because you want to be a man of faith. But we must all be teachable. All be pliable. Jesus, I need your help. The thing that will send the most people to hell is not atheism. It's religion. People hardening their hearts to the voice of the Lord. Verse 46. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Speaking of himself. The Father sent him, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. He's seen the Father, so he's the only one, the only one that knows what he's talking about. Verse 47, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. He preaches this again and again throughout the Gospel of John. Salvation begins at believing in him. I am the bread of life. How do we eat the bread of life? By believing in Jesus. Let's make that connection. Believing is like eating. If we go to a restaurant after church and we eat, it's because we believe the food we're about to eat is good, right? So even eating begins with believing. Has anybody had food poison? Food poisoning? You ever had food poisoning at a particular restaurant in some city, some some place in the world? And you had to go back there? It's kind of a you have to kind of push yourself, right? What is that? You're wrestling with your believing. Jesus is the bread of life. We receive the benefits of that bread when we believe in him. I am the bread of life. Verse 48. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. You know, these people are wanting breakfast, temporary food. People live to eat and eat to live, and it's not going to lead us to eternal life. The people that ate that miracle bread 
in the wilderness eventually died. And they had to eat it every day because it was temporary. Temporary blessing. Verse 50. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. That is the gospel. Jesus is our bread, and he gave his life. He went through the furnace of affliction for us. He got baked, saints, for us. And through believing in him as our offering for our sin, we are freed from our sin and its penalties and its powers and we receive eternal life. That's good news. 52. The Jews, now keep in mind, this is in Capernaum. So not only are the people there that he fed, but there's the people there that he didn't feed. So they're really confused. They didn't see the signs. They're just in Capernaum. And there he is in their synagogue saying these profound things. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They're thinking cannibalism. They're not thinking offering for sin. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, this happened was around the time of Passover. This is one of the Passovers Jesus did not go to Jerusalem. The Passover was a feast that Moses instituted on the night they were delivered from slavery. In every household, a lamb was slain at the, in the threshold of the house. And that lamb was cooked. And they ate that lamb with unleavened bread. Keep that in mind. And they drank the fruit of the vine, and had a meal together to give them energy to make the journey to freedom. The blood of that lamb was applied to the top of the doorway and to the sides of the doorway. So you have blood in four places. You have blood at the foot where the lamb was slain. You have blood on the right, blood on the left, blood at the top. If you draw a line between those positions of blood, what do you have? The cross. It's a picture of Jesus. Through his blood, our sins are paid for. Through his broken body, sin's damage is healed. Verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. He's not talking cannibalistic. He is talking relationship language. Have you ever been so in love that you ate and slept the person you wanted to marry? I was consumed by that. I ate and slept her. All I could think about was her. May God give us such a love for him that he becomes our life. Verse 58. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He keeps reminding them. You know, you guys put your, put your faith in the faith of your forefathers. They're all dead. <laughs> He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? It's tough. But at Passover, and every time we take communion, the mystery is solved. It's like he gave them a giant riddle. And the key to it is communion. The key to it is their Passover. How is Jesus, the bread of life, 
Well, let's look at what he said. Twice he said, I am the bread of life in this passage. Another place he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Another time he said, I am the bread of life. Twice he said it. Another time he said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Everything about Jesus points to this. I'm wrapping things up here. We're going to take communion together. In what ways is Jesus the bread of life? What things point to him being the bread of life? Well, he came down from heaven like manna. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. Holy Spirit is God. The Father is God. Jesus is God. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit came to bring salvation to mankind. So he's the manna, the eternal manna. Number two, he was born in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem means the house of bread. It's also David's hometown, and uh, he was born to the son of David. He never sinned. That is, he was like unleavened bread. Leaven is a picture of sin. Every year at Passover, you had to go through your house and purge it of all forms of mold. All yeast had to be gone. The Passover bread was not leavened. It didn't, they didn't have time for the bread to rise. It was, an, it was like an emergency meal. They were fixing to hit the road. He was furnished with afflictions for us all. Isaiah 53. Is symbolized by taking communion when we drink the cup and eat the bread. He must be received for his benefits. You can have some great food at your house. Oh, isn't that food wonderful? But if you don't partake of it, you don't receive the benefits of it. He wants to be your personal Savior. Oh, that's fine for you Christians. The gospel is just wonderful. What a beautiful story. I wish I could believe it. You won't receive the benefits of it. You receive it personally. Not intellectually, personally. And finally, he was pierced and striped like matzah. Watch this. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Matzah, the bread of Passover, is a picture of Jesus. It is unleavened, made without yeast. He was born in Bethlehem, house of bread, and was without sin. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are our bread. I pray that you would open the eyes of every person in this room that has not received the joy of salvation, did not receive the free gift that you give. Thank you, Lord, for being our bread. May we receive you and celebrate you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Bread of heaven, sin down from God.
Praise Jesus this morning. Just join me as as we pray over this. Lord Jesus, your word says that this literally is your body. And that we do this in remembrance of you today. We don't do it lightly, but we do it with an understanding of all that you did for us, Lord Jesus. That you laid down, literally laid down your life so that each and every one of us could have life. And we also do this in remembrance of the fact that you didn't leave us alone, that you're still with us, and that you're coming again to be with us and to restore your kingdom. Lord Jesus, we give you praise for what you did for us as we take this, your body, and we receive it this morning, giving you praise in Jesus' name. on your back to your pure side the blood that flowed you suffered for us when you bowed your earthly head you also released your emotions and your mind and your will to the Father as we prepare to drink this Lord words cannot express the gratitude that we owe you for the blood that was shed for the previous generations, for this generation, and generations to come. Lord, give us the strength daily to release our emotions, our mind, and our will over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 